Signal Sciences is the industry's first web protection platform that works in any cloud, any container, any platform as a service, and any modern application architecture. The Signal Sciences web protection platform can be deployed in next generation WAF, RASP, or reverse proxy modes, giving customers ultimate flexibility and coverage. Protect your web applications with Signal Sciences web protection platform. Signal Sciences, protecting applications, connecting teams. For more information, check them out at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Onapsis is the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at onapsis.com. The SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security certification training and research. Visit sans.org to explore their full curriculum and latest training offerings. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. It's wonderful to be back here. Chris Crowley is going to give a technical segment. I want to uh, tell everyone about the SANS Hack Fest, November 13th through the 20th. There's going to be all kinds of things, including Net Wars with a coin of Palooza, Cyber City Missions, uh, two days of talks that make up the Hack Fest Summit on the 13th and the 14th of November. You can go to sans.org forward slash hackfest17. Security Weekly listeners get $300 off by using the discount code HackFest17 at registration, which is really awesome. I don't know what made me think of this, but um, I had, uh, there was like a bug in, in my office. I bugged myself. I left a go-to meeting uh, thing running in my oh office God. to connect it to a conference phone, right? And there, our, our meeting that was uh, late had, I left it running, so like a half an hour after the meeting was supposed to start, that person joined and was listening to the conversation in my <laughs> office. Like, I totally bugged myself, right? And I'm, I'm really thankful that the conversation, which could have been, like, it could have been really bad. Um, the conversation was between our new intern here, Kyle, and I talking about Raspberry Pis and how I had fried a Raspberry Pi and melted one in implementing Raspberry Pi. So <laughs> thankfully, and, and it was like a productive conversation that Kyle and I were having, uh, who's doing a fantastic job. Uh, or was it just phone sex like well, usual? It was, that was probably <laughs> yeah. the first time, first one all day that you had a productive. Uh, <laughs> it was actually a productive conversation about Raspberry Pi. Can, can you get extra cheese on, on that, or, or does it just come plain? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I was, yeah. I was, yeah. Just, about, I was uh, just about to say, Paul fried it, and then it was so tasty he ate it. <laughs> I did fry it. There was I had the the plastic uh, case on the Raspberry Pi, and it it wasn't. I didn't quite seat it right or it just wasn't quite right and when I put the SD card in it kind of like offset and crushed the SD card and it made oh. a short Ooh. and I took the SD card out and like I couldn't hold it it was so hot yeah. and it had melted some of the plastic oh, boy. and that Raspberry Pi will never I mean unless you've got some serious electrical engineering skills will, will not work again. you probably have to take out the SD card micro SD card reader and yeah. it put a new one in because some of the, the pins yeah. are crushed in there uh, making a short you uh, broke, and cause it to you broke overheat. the golden rule. Paul, you broke the golden rule. You, you're never supposed to let the smoke out of the box. I know. Yes. <laughs> so I, I did that. Uh, I will say, though, that uh, Kyle and I successfully removed the SD card from a running uh, Raspberry Pi, made a backup of it, switched to a new SD card. Mm. Uh, and hopefully that one is running now. We did we oh, did fix a, a problem. The the frying happened happened earlier. Oh. It is identified by the melted case that's on it, so I know not to use. <laughs> it's easy, that to, one. easy to find that one. That one's in my like box of stuff for Larry to fix. That's <laughs> it. like my stuff that I fry so bad. I'm like, this is like Larry. Uh, Larry, yeah. if you have some spare time and want to, you know, practice your yeah. soldering mm -hmm. skills, like here, here you go. Maybe or, Doug, or maybe Doug, Doug, you, I, you've got solder, some soldering yeah. skills. Larry's got the hammering skills. Yeah. Like, you <laughs> so know, it's like it's it's fixed now. <laughs> fixed now. I shot a potato cannon at it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I shot it out of a potato cannon. <laughs> So uh, Chris Crowley is here with us. Uh, he is one of the authors for SANS Management 517, uh, holds a host of certifications, and is just an illustrious member of the security community uh, and the SANS community as well. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Now, Chris, have you been on the show before? I want to say that you have at least once. Yeah, once. Actually, just once, and it was probably mm, three years ago. Okay. It's been a while. Okay, so yeah, it's nice to have you on, and you're going to be talking about mobile application assessments, and I really do feel like many of us in the security community, especially those of us just getting into it, are kind of put off about doing mobile application assessments because of like the environment that you have to create in order to do that, to get it working in emulation, the understanding of the apps and all that stuff. 
Um, I'm hoping you can kind of lower that barrier to entry uh, for yeah, us here today in the show. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm actually going to talk about a couple different ways that you can approach it. I'll talk about um, a couple different setups, just things to get things um, going. And one of the things that I'm going to focus on is initially just uh, some network discussion because a lot of people already have skills in looking at network traffic, so how to set yeah. things up and watch that. But awesome. And then uh, it'll get a little more complicated because if you're really going to do a good uh, assessment, you need to start to get into code. But you don't always need to do that. So mm. I'll also try to give people a framework of like, if you have a couple of things that you care about, here's where you start. Awesome. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it. Let me switch over to this. Start that up. Should have uh, something that looks like a there you go. presentation up there. All right. So anyway, if you want to holler at me later, C. Crow Montance is a uh, Twitter handle if you want to talk to me. So anyway, um, Josh Wright uh, originally wrote this, the uh, top eight steps for mobile device security. So good password code authentication. I don't know um, if anyone remembers the time where default was you didn't even do that. Mm -hmm. um, just monitoring access patching devices, prohibiting third-party app stores, which for Android in particular is a huge problem, physical access to the devices and you know, managing that, evaluating application security compliance, which is what I'm going to uh, talk about, have a good incident response plan, and then also just uh, management and operational support around all this. So the focus for this that, you know, tonight is just basically um, app assessment. But if you're, if you're really thinking about the, the hygiene overall for your organization, how you're going to do things, those eight steps are good guideposts. Um, in terms of uh, going through it. And these are pretty much in order of, of uh, valuable capability. So for an organization, you need, you need to do a bunch of work in terms of actually making this uh, happen. So that's what I'm trying to give people is a good framework to approach the problem and start working on it. So first off, just, you know, what are you trying to look at? Are you concerned about the you know loss of data? Are you concerned about the a modification of that data so that something could get onto the phone and then someone could change that is a somewhat of a different concern um, than, oh, I'm just going to lose the data in transit. Um, are you trying to build a program out where you could basically look at BYOD? Because BYOD starts to present different different aspects of, of a challenge. And what I'm going to uh, what I'm going to talk about, you can use for you know basically for looking at BYOD, but then you pretty much are concerned about can the app take information out of the container or can the user do something on the platform to be able to pull information out of that container that's supposed to protect that data and then also you have the uh, concern of modification there too um, and then you know basically most people are looking to protect organizationally owned assets so if here's your uh, here's your company issued phone can you know a user um, do something that'll mess with that? But also, this is starting to become the way that all of our point of sale is going. And I actually have a lot of people ask me about a point of sale specifically because it's kind of it's kind of hip to have uh, you know a little tablet in the in the store and you, instead of walking someone up to the cash register, they feel way better about dumping loads of money if the uh, salesperson is ringing them up on an iPad, right? And so that's just something that. People don't realize that this is a, an assessment component that not a lot of people are actually doing. And then the last part of this is, are you going to help your employees by doing um, assessment on their behalf? And it's actually kind of a cheat, but I think it's a good thing to think about, is if you do some of that, it's a little bit of a, you know, a generous um, hand to do that, but it also makes sure that the people that you're entrusting with your data have good security practices on their own personal devices. So it's sort of like, okay, you know, out of those considerations, what do you want to work with? So two overarching um, approaches to this. The first one is thorough inspection. Tear the entire application apart, look at everything that it could possibly do, and then decide, do I want this app on my corporate asset or will I you know, let this on my own phone or not? The other way is just decide what you would care about where you would actually not use the app for something. And so a couple of examples, like if someone's taking my location, um, you know, when I'm, uh, I don't know, checking uh, you know, something on an, on an app that I don't really care very much about and associating that with my personal information and then sending that off to their, to their server, I usually don't want to install that app. I mean, there are some exceptions to that, but if it's just some random company, I don't really want them having the ability to track where I am physically. Um, so those sort of things, I call them showstoppers or red flags or whatever. What you could do is decide what are the things that if the app does it, 
I, I won't install the app and then only look for those and then you're done. And it's actually a much more expeditious way to approach the problem, particularly for organizations who are concerned about spending a lot of resources on this. So you got to pick one of the two paradigms. Um, and another thing just to, you know, to talk about with this is that this is actually really hard work. It's fairly complicated. You can get a lot of value out of some easy stuff, but if you're really going super deep, even Apple and uh, Google miss a bunch of stuff, and Google misses way more stuff mm. than Apple does, um, just from the uh, perspective of examples of malicious code that we have in the uh, Google Store versus the Apple Store. Xcode Ghost is a is a good I, uh, iOS example, but for Google, basically they had they have had a large number of malicious apps living in the App Store for extended periods of time. Then the other part of this is just, you know, you got to have some sort of methodology, apply it consistently, get good practices and work through it. Otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of time. And look at this. Um, Josh Wright was uh, kind enough. This was actually uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe even two years ago, that uh, Josh started working on this. And he came up with these uh, mobile app report cards. The idea behind this is it's basically here are the things that you need to check. Right. You can download these um, and there's a graded um, scoring mechanism. Now, you as the analyst need to determine the answer to these questions and then assign a grade based on the, uh, the capability. But if you need a mobile app assessment program in a hurry, there you are. You just download these and figure out how to answer those questions effectively and then start working through it. So this, yeah, this Chris, is phenomenal I, stuff. Chris, I, I think this is fantastic. And uh, a drawing from my own experiences, there was a uh, actually a retail company that I'm not too particularly fond of that uh, had an app uh, for both iOS and Android. And I experienced a very poor user experience with this application on top of me not really liking the, the way this company conducts business. And out of necessity for the features, my wife and I installed the app. And due to the poor user experience, like my like spidey sense is tingling. I'm like, there's got to be something wrong with this app. If they didn't spend that much time on user experience, in your report card example, Chris, I'm like, I guarantee you they would have failed. Turns out, uh, about a few weeks later, I'm covering my security news, and guess what? They leak your location <laughs> information to other third parties wow. outside wow. of the app oh, yeah. provider, oh, yeah. and were the results of a, a, a pretty uh, significant vulnerability, and offered no public comment as a response to this oh, vulnerability, nice. kind of confirming <laughs> my feelings about the company uh, and my spidey sense that was happening on the app. So I think this is absolutely fantastic. Now, is this an exercise you recommend that individuals go through when evaluating apps and both companies that are evaluating apps to approve? Because uh, I know in both ecosystems, you can, as an organization, if you're managing the phone, approve the, uh, certain applications for users. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's good for both. I think that um, technically and with the amount of work that it takes, a lot of individuals are going to have a tough time really doing this consistently because we rarely have an opportunity to do this. But you're like, you're, you, you know, you're, you're out in the city and you got to park and you get like park now app or whatever it says mm -hmm. on the, on the, you know, the, the parking place. It's like, you have to download this app if you want to pay for it. And so then you just download it and you don't really have that opportunity. I would still, encourage people to start to do this consistently when they're not under pressure to install things so they get their skill set up, they have an understanding of the way that these apps generally work. And then again, that spidey sense gets a little more fine-tuned where you're looking at something you're like, nah, I think I'm going to go like get some singles or some quarters and actually pay for this with cash yeah. rather than installing that one, just, just based on things. Actually, there's a group out of um, North Carolina State University that does a lot of research on um, malicious apps, like, you know, malware type stuff. Mm. And, and they basically said, and this was a, a, about um, a, three years ago, and I think it's Zhang is the guy's name, one of the researchers named um, Z-H-E-N-G. Um, he was saying that basically the likelihood of a, of a mobile application being malicious correlates strongly with its um, number of permissions declared. Interesting. <laughs> just Interesting. Like, yeah. Just like count the number of permissions. If there are loads of them, um, you got a high, higher chance of it being malware. So it, it also correlates strongly with whether or not you downloaded it in a strip club. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's. <laughs> Wait, me? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah.
That's Doug. That's Doug. <laughs> Chris, have you run some of the, the, the bigger apps through this? Like, I mean, so many people use Uber. Of course, it's probably one of the most popular apps. You have to install it out of necessity. Yeah. I mean, it's become the de facto yeah. standard. I mean, they're the category king in, in terms of transportation, especially for many of us that, go to, that travel a lot and go to conferences. Um, I, I started using Uber really late in the game. Um, but I really like it. But how do some of these larger apps uh, fare in, in, in Josh's tests? So it's actually interesting. Um, you, we, we haven't done any specifically and then like publicly released the actual grades for them. Um, but in general, the larger apps tend to have um, better hygiene. Interesting. My experience in looking at things mm. um, – Uber is an example. I haven't specifically graded it, um, or if I have, I'm not going to tell you. Um, mm -hmm. But <laughs> you know, because uh, they seem like a fairly litigious company to me. So <laughs> it's one of those things that I'm just like. Uh, anyway, so um, basically, they their code is is pretty good because they have they have a lot of developers. And yeah, like, they, they have they resources. Have good, right. Exactly. It's the it's the media it's the medium sized companies that mm -hmm. really scare me, where they're like, oh, what the hell? Who cares? You know, well, we're going to be out of business in, in six months anyway if we don't sell some of these things. So pff, why are we going to put the resources on? Right. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, well, well, I wanted to bring it up earlier. I was kind of saving it for later, but we we sort of keep tripping over this this uh, idea. Uh, you know, back when I was uh, doing the PCI thing, we had a a customer that wanted to use, or I think they actually they wanted to develop um, uh, a mobile point of sale app. And, uh, and, you know, they wanted to put it out on the Apple store and I simply asked the question, has anybody tested it? Mm -hmm. And the only response I ever really got was, well, it's, it's on the Apple store. Apple does the testing. No. So my first question is, it, it, you know, based on what you were saying earlier about who fares better, Apple or Google, on, on the various mobile apps, it, is there a, a – well, and it goes further than that. Apple claimed that they had uh, testing criteria and they did all sorts of things, but they weren't willing to share that. And for me, with a DoD background that you know used to design crypto systems based on the assumption that the adversary knows everything about it and it's still secure, that kind of raised a red flag for me. Like, why are you afraid to you know share even what your testing criteria is? So there's a couple questions in there. One, you know, the the companies like Apple and Google and and the apps that are making it out onto their their various stores, how much testing and 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 security testing in particular are they actually putting the apps through? Um, and and I, I guess the second question is, uh, you know, you alluded to we might have looked at an app and the bigger apps are better. And I think most people think that, but is there any standard coming down the pike? Is there any is there any criteria that's public? Is there any uh, testing criteria for any of these apps that the apps have to go through, or is it just buyer beware? Um, so a bunch of questions in there. So let me try and uh, pull them apart. Yep. First of all, in terms of uh, security assessment associated with. Um, mobile applications when they go to Apple and when they go to Google. Um, my opinion is that both of those organizations are far more interested in protecting their platform mm. from attacks to the platform by the apps than they are necessarily focused on protecting the end users' interests and data. Okay, so that's my opinion, and I, and I think that that's sort of the the stance that those both of those companies take. Um, again, my opinion, um, I think that Apple does a better job based on the incidence of malicious uh, software that's that's out there. As an example, there was a there was a study. Um, I say a study, but it was actually just somebody doing research and released it. Um, and I'm pretty sure this one was in 15, where basically they said 50% of the top 1,000 um, apps on the Google Play Store had shared secrets embedded in the code. So like some sort of a key or some other data that was used to actually like in some way protect information, but was easily reversed out of it. So 50% of the top 1,000 downloaded applications in the, um, in the 
Google Play Store had that sort of flaw. Same sort of thing when, um, you know, we, we had the um, add JavaScript interface flaw. And that one was a while ago. But um, when, when that came out, you know, like basically all of the, uh, <laughs> I forget the exact number, but it was an even higher percentage of that, um, were vulnerable to that particular flaw. It was a latent flaw, but all of the apps exhibited it. Um, so from the perspective of how much security checking are they doing, they're doing a bunch. Um, their interest is they don't want to have an app that lands in there and starts like rooting phones um, or jailbreaking phones. Um, you know, that's the really scary thing, I think, for them. And I think that they're trying to protect users' data. But at the same time, um, they have to then manage what's, what do you consider spyware versus what, um, you know, LinkedIn or Facebook or Uber or any of these companies that are making loads of money want to put on your phone. And, and again, you know, it's like, both of these companies make money through ad revenue, advertisement revenue. Mm -hmm. Both of them make money because people are using their ecosystem. So at a certain point, like whose side are they on? Mm, the people that are that are funding that mm -hmm. app development and and the users, as you mentioned, caveat emptor, right? I mean, like the users are the ones who have the information that's ultimately for sale because they're the consumer. So you do have to be guarded about that and realize that um, there is some assessment that goes on, but it's not what you care about. It's not your focus. It's, it's, it's something that I think people need to take in hand and start to do a little more work on. So, so do continue, yeah. Chris. Yeah. So uh, uh, just basically report cards hit a bunch of, bunch of important things data storage, um, the idea of having um, flaws in the code, because you know you can choose to downgrade some of the protections that are otherwise um, in, available from the operating system. Um, another part of this is, like I said, I'm not going to go uh, grade Uber and put it out there. So just be careful. Make sure that you have authorization to access. And from, from discussions that I've had with lawyers who, um, you know, um, we're willing to talk to me. Basically, you know, the, the thing that I've arrived at is if you have authority to assess an application for interoperability with a computer network or a computer system or an information system that you own, operate, manage, um, and you have written permission from somebody who can grant you that permission, um, you should be okay with doing some of the stuff that I'm going to show you. Other than that, you know, <laughs> if you take information from someone else's app and go release it and um, that person gets upset, just don't be surprised. Hmm. So to start off with, um, the idea here is that uh, network is the easiest and actually is going to give you a lot of the value. This is where I'd start. Um, we have a couple of challenges. TLS is going to is going to uh, protect their communication, and that's going to be uh, an issue for us. And I'll talk about some ways to overcome that. Um, hidden or obfuscated data and having to unpack a lot of data, and de you know, basically um, deobfuscate it or um, decode it in some way. And then another thing that actually happens sometimes is the app has some condition um, that in your testing, you do not meet the criteria. And so then the app doesn't behave in the way that you might deem inappropriate. And then you miss it, but you think it's okay. Um, and you know, great example of this is if the, um, the app changes behavior based on your GPS location um, and you don't get the right coordinates in there then you'll never see that if you're only looking at the network traffic, right? So any of those sorts of triggers, date, time, location, um, specific action, another specific applications installed on the phone, any of those sorts of things, you might miss it, okay? So that's a downside with the network stuff. Um, just from a setup perspective, a couple of things. One is you just have a native host uh, with a, um, a some sort of a Wi-Fi connected um, access point hanging off of it. And then you run all the traffic from the Wi-Fi access point in through the host to be able to do your interception and then send it out. Um, I actually usually end up, well, and you know, right now what I'm, what I'm doing is I have a Windows native host, but I want to run Linux for my interception. So I end up having a VM and then I connect a USB connected NIC to the VM and then I have my Wi-Fi access point hanging off of that and then the virtual machine goes out. It's a little bit more complicated, but I just kind of like it better because it gives me um, the, the Linux environment, but mo the laptop that I'm running this on most of the time isn't, um, isn't 
Windows, I'm sorry, isn't Linux native. Um, so that's just the way that it goes. Uh, but if you do want to do a Windows native thing, I have a write up that's, I'll just run through it really quick. Basically, if you have a USB Wi Fi card, and I'm just using the AWS 036 NHA as an example, you can actually create an access point on that Wi Fi card and then you use your other Wi Fi or wired connection to go through. Um, and I have, it's, it's fairly simple. Um, you do this, you'll install the Burp CA. Um, we're going to do man in the middle with Burp anyway, so we wanna be able to see this. And then you have to set up a little bit of uh, network configuration in order to be able to do this, uh, this NetSHW HWLAN. Um, basically what you can do is enable this as a um, Wi-Fi access point on a card rather than having to have a separate um, access point. I, I figured this out one time a year ago because I was in a rush doing an app assessment and I didn't have an access point with me, so I had to figure out how to do this. So mm. I just kind of figured I'd share that with so people. So Chris, that, that's a that's a you're using a physical uh, mobile device with apps installed on it. You're yep. connecting to a wireless network that is running through your laptop that you're able to do interception and analysis of the traffic. Correct? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And um, I I tend to like that better. I mean, we can do we can do virtual devices and all that. Virtual mm -hmm. devices, in some ways, it's a little bit easier because it's it's a it's a process running on your system, so you can then go ahead and uh, go ahead and just like manipulate it. I tend to prefer um, the mobile phone with an mm -hmm. app installed um, and then running live traffic off of it. Um, it's a little bit of overhead, but I think that it gives a better uh, better view of what's of what's going on there. Because some apps will actually do a little detection and be like, oh, I'm not gonna run this virtual device. Um, so I'll talk about how to pull um, apps off you know, from uh, from phones, but you can, you can certainly install things in uh, virtual devices as well. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the way that I typically run it is I've got a the Kali VM. I pass the NIC into the Kali VM and then I have a Wi-Fi pineapple that I use for, you know, for whatever, but I just configure it as an access point. Um, and then I have a little modified, um, oops, I have a little modified um, Wi-Fi pineapple script to auto detect things and, you know, auto intercept and just add a bunch of other stuff. So if you want to grab that script, I wrote that up years ago and you can you can use that but basically i'm doing some pre-routing for um for nat and be able to say okay grab this push it into burp and, and run with it mm -hmm. now we get network traffic and you start doing this sort of inspection of the uh of the traffic seeing what's in there um but you have to deal with tls and this is actually a good thing right it's a good thing that there isn't a lot of plain text traffic anymore the the idea that there's plain text traffic immediately is a problem because any mobile phone is basically running on untrusted networks. So all the plain text uh, traffic is immediately interceptable. So um, the idea that I have here is just browse directly to the, um, to the BERT proxy, um, collect the certificate, then run a um, you know, Python server, grab the certificate off of that from the mobile device, because of course it's connected on the same network as your, uh, as your laptop. So grab the um, grab that from that Python server and then save it, and then you can go ahead and um, install a, a CA cert from from storage. And now you've got TLS intercept, right? Ooh. So this is uh, this is a great thing because now all of a sudden you can see uh, inside of it. You control the phone, so this is relatively easy, particularly for um, for not very strongly defended apps. So, Chris, uh, on your mobile device, do you have to uh, authorize that certificate? In other words, yep. Okay. Yeah, when you when you install it from the um, from storage, it'll then go into your cert store, and you're in good shape. I gotcha. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, so uh, I got a quick question, uh, uh, sure. Paul, uh, Chris. Um, have you uh, run into the problem of Burp Suite having two week? Um, a certificate and HMAC uh, signature. That's a great question. And having to generate your own um, CA for Burp Suite itself before installing I, I, the stuff. I actually, uh, I actually haven't done that yet. Um, I've done a lot of CA generation um, previously, so it usually takes me about ten minutes to Google to find the right uh, mm -hmm. um, open SSL yeah. commands, <laughs> and then about three minutes yeah. to create my CA. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, yeah it's like sure. creating a C CA is really no big deal. You just need to go like um, look it up. It's about it's usually about five or ten steps, and then you should be in good shape. Um, but open SSL is is the way. There are a couple other ones out there, but I I generally just do it manually with open SSL and have it there. But I haven't I actually haven't run into it specifically. 
Okay. Yep. I did in some of my testing and, uh, uh-huh. uh, you know, I, I actually found that uh, generating like a 4096 bit uh, CA cert and uh, uh, signing it with like SHA-256 and installing it inside a burp and then distributing it out uh, actually fixed some of those problems. But some of our customers are, are you know, sort of higher end on, on the certificate requirements. So that's yeah, why I mentioned Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, the other thing with the certificate requirements is now you potentially have cert pinning. Uh, cert pinning is a, uh, you know, a, a challenge. I'll talk a little bit later about um, about manipulating the apps. So I'm going to defer the cert pinning component of that. But just because the cert, and this is a really important thing for people listening, just because the cert is in your trust store does not mean that an application will necessarily accept the certificate signed from that particular CA. In fact, cert pinning is an advisable thing. And so having to undo cert pinning should be perceived as a positive thing for you. You still should do it as part of your app assessment. Um, if you can't get to that point, then you're really not going to see very much. But I get a good feeling when I'm like, oh, good, I, I need to do uh, you know some sort of um, um, manipulation. And on iOS, you can use SSL kill switch, and there are ways to, to manipulate things um, in, uh, in Android as well. Um, Android, probably the easiest way is to go and um, rewrite the app and then um, use some uh, sort of modified functionality to be able to see stuff. So, but that gets that gets complicated. Um, and then, of course, you know, you're just basically like grabbing grabbing stuff, looking at things, watch watch what's happening on the network. And this is a thing that I see people start doing this, and they're like hammering away on the phone of doing all these things. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like you're not even tracking what you're doing. So if you find anything interesting, how the hell are you going to know what you did that caused that interesting thing to happen? And and really, you should slow way, way, way down and take notes of what you're pushing. And when you push data into it, same sort of thing with like you're fuzzing it. You want to have distinct data in each thing. So track what fields you're putting data entry in, record time. It makes it super easy afterwards. It take, it's slower, but it makes it super easy in your analysis of network traffic. So just kind of a, a takeaway from that. And then, of course, you go and look at conversations, look at the, look at the communication, see what's there, and see what's actually uh, what's happening to be able to um, basically go through and start this uh, assessment. And what people are looking for, again, going back to those report cards, is all of the network traffic type scoring. Are they doing... Um, you know, cert pinning, are they um, accepting any old certificate? So you can uh, start to look at that and then start to look for code, I'm sorry, for um, for content that you actually care about. So that's network stuff. And that's the easier side of things. It starts to get a little more complicated after that. Next thing is code. So um, this is just, again, a complex task. Like I said, Apple and Google are doing it, but they're not great at it. Um, you need some tools to help um, one thing that you can do, and I actually, the, my preferred way for grabbing the APKs from Android is to use ES File Explorer. So on the ES File Explorer screen, you can go look at your list of apps. There's an app tab, um, and then you press, press and hold the app, um, and that will then um, give you a um, icon that you can then back it up. Now for so, iOS, uh, Chris, sorry for Android. Uh, ES File Explorer is that an app you install on Android, or is that something you put in your desktop and then you access your Android device over the ADB or, or Android Debugger protocol? Yeah, absolutely. That ES File Explorer is an app that you put on Android. Okay. And the reason and the reason for that is that if you use ADB to try to pull a file. Mm-hmm. Um, you may not have access, and you usually do not have access to um, uh, actually directly pull the APK file that you're interested in hmm. because you won't have permissions to be able to get to the directory to do that. Hmm. However, the app on the phone will be able to take that and then it drops it to the SD card, and then you can ADB pull it off of the SD card. Okay, gotcha. Right. And then so for iOS, um, this is way more complicated. In hmm. order to get the code, you must have a jailbroken phone. Like that's you know if you're gonna. But if you're I, gonna I thought do, jail. I thought jailbreakers were like done. Like they threw their hands up. They were like, "There's not enough incentive for users to jailbreak their phone today." So we kind of gave up. We have methods, but it's not even worth it to publish it because Apple's going to sue us. Yeah, yeah. That's that's um, the the. I mean, in a sense, yes. Um, but still, for a while, we still have a lot of backward compatible stuff. Where if you haven't updated a phone, um, you still have a jailbroken phone. You can gotcha. still put 
put it on there. So, you know, yeah, I, I was, I, I was going to jump in there and say, you know, Paul, I've done a few mobile assessments and, and the key is to grab a phone that, that has a jailbroken version or a jailbreakable version yep. uh, on it. And, uh, you know, just, just stand pat with that. Uh, yeah. so that, you know, don't, don't upgrade, don't, don't gotcha. go forward basically. Exactly. And, yeah. and again, like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use a jailbroken phone as my daily phone. No. Um, so I just have lots of test phones to be mm. able to, you know, do this. And once I find a phone that I can jailbreak, it stays jailbroken forever and I never upgrade it after that. Awesome. So, yeah, but, um, that, that, um, that is going away. Apple has done a very good job in their architecture of making that much harder mm. to actually, uh, to well, actually. And I've, I've, it's funny. I've read about, uh, jailbreakers that have it and they just, they don't even want to disclose it to Apple because right. it's just not even worth it anymore. Then Apple blocks it. And then and Apple blocks it and then it's yeah, out. You're yeah. giving up your yep. tool right. right there. Yep. Yeah, and they absolutely. may sue you mm -hmm. if enough yeah, people yeah, have yeah. it. If enough, if you give it away to a lot of people, then Apple comes right after you. Fiduciary yeah. harm. Mm. <laughs> so, indeed. But yeah, so this is what I was just saying. So ES File Explorer, you go into the app component, you go, you long press the app that you're interested in, grab it, and then it drops it to SD card backups, and then you can pull that off. Even if you don't have an SD card, that directory uh, slash SD card is still present because it's simulated um, hmm. for the uh, for the file system. Um, and it's a space that can be written to and accessed via uh, ADB. Um then what you need to do is start to look at the what the app does. And so here I'm using Java to run a jar. This is the Android XML Printer 2 jar. And that takes the binary encoded XML and produces a nice, um, 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 excuse me, it, it produces, I just saw that I have a typo on my slide. Um, it, it produces a, a nice um, output. It should be Android Manifest. Uh, XML as opposed to Android Manifest.txt, um, and then it dumps that content out. Um, so, so then you look at the permissions that are declared. Mm -hmm. um, the permissions will tell you what sort of things it can do. The downside to this is that with the permissions, you have to go basically reverse from the developer's um, page on android.com to be able to figure out exactly what it's doing. There have been a couple different apps out, I'm sorry, not apps, but projects out there that have worked really hard to do the, uh, to do the reverse correlation from a permission to the allowable method calls. Mm -hmm. And there's some people who have worked um, and have some, some projects in the past um, that would take the code and then find the permissions that are declared and then go look through the code and say, okay, so this is declaring this particular permission and here are all the methods that are present in the in the APK that are related to this particular permission. Um, the reason why that's such a difficult thing is um, it's just there's no one place where it's documented where that information's there. Now it's in the source code. Um, actually, I, I, it's interesting. I worked with a guy out of Turkey. Um, I, I had done, I had put this thing on the HoneyNet project as one of the Google Summer of Code um, things, and nobody picked it up. But this guy from Turkey contacted me. He's like, "This seems really cool," um, and he did it as his master's thesis. And I'm still waiting on um, the the thing that he actually produced. But I was like, "Make this tool. This is awesome. This would be really useful." The challenge is it just um, so like every version, you know, now you've got Oreo coming out, you've got, you've got, um, to redo all of those permission to method mappings. It's all there somewhere, but, um, you know, the bigger challenge is how do we build something like that for the long term? That's funny. I, I just, I just upgraded my phone to Oreo. It's I, yeah. I, I got a Google uh, pixel. So yeah, me too. I've got the, I've got a pixel, uh, with, with Phi. I use, I have, no surprise, a couple of phones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, any, any researcher that's doing work in any kind of mobile phone assessment has at least, like what, Chris, like half a dozen phones at least. At least. <laughs> yeah. So I have... I I, have I, I'm curious. I, I, I'm curious, Chris, one, one quick question. Uh, with respect to Manifest, you know, how many apps are you running across that, that like vastly over ask for permissions, even if it's innocent. Totally, I, I, I see that. And actually um, a woman by the name of, uh, um, I think her name was Adrian Porterfelt. She now works for Google. Um, she was at like um, Stanford or wherever. Um, she had a tool called Stowaway that was really cool. Um, that what it would do is it would actually do an assessment of the app 
and say, okay, they declared all these permissions. Let me go check. Again, same problem as what I was just describing. Let me go check if there is at least one method that's necessary for this pr- particular permission. Right. When it comes down to it, I think that um, I think that over time they've gotten better about not doing that. But from a developer perspective, it's like, hey, why the hell not? Throw it in there. What's the difference? You know. Um, but I. Right. I I just think that it's sloppy coding, and if they're sloppy coding on this, then they're sloppy coding on other things. Then not taking good security precautions. Well, so yeah, you see that I can totally see it, but I can totally see it. Like, for example, if you're coding in Python and you import a library, and then you're like, "Oh, I wrote a bunch of code," and then you're like, "Ah, uh, that's not quite the right thing. I need to import something else," and you never take out your original import yep. statement. It's yep. the same exact yep. thing. Yep, totally. And, and yeah, exactly. you'll see a lot of, of, of beginning programmers just jump in and say, I can't get something to work, and they'll dump permissions. Yep. And, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. and, you know, and I mean, it's not like some kind of nefarious thing. It's just like you're trying to get your code to work. You've been sitting there for seven yeah. hours, and it's like, okay, I'm just going to turn this off and make it work. And then, you know, two years later, somebody's dissecting it, yes. going, oh, this guy sucks. And, <laughs> and that's why attorneys were invented. Yeah. Well, Fiduciary harm. Fiduciary harm. He loves that term. <laughs> Well, the other part of that, too, is like, you know, who are these developers? They're people that are just working, trying to make things work. And right. once it works, usually they don't get a chance to go back and clean it up. Why? Because they don't have time. It's just like they're not given time to make their code beautiful. It's like and, make and, it work. And marketing promised that the app would be out this Friday. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. So then the, the next thing going forward, so now we have a sense of the permissions. Um, we start looking at code. Um, my favorite single thing for um, for Android to do this is JADX. It's free. It's good quality. It does a relatively good job decompiling things. Um, but you're reading Java code at this point. Uh, interestingly, this Java code is not um, is not recompilable. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Smalley um, later. But uh, another tool that's out there is um, Jeb. Now, Jeb is a commercial tool, um, but it does a lot of nice, like, automatic renaming and stuff for you. But Josh Wright actually has a talk just on how to how to do that. Um, and what he does is he uses the JADX command line, decompiles the uh, the code, and then brings that into Android Studio, hmm. and then he could do the global renaming. So if you have to do a lot of this sort of work um, and you don't have any funding for tools, um, then JADX... Uh, JADX command line, and then um, Android Studio, you can end up with something that's kind of close to Jeb. But if you're doing this all the time, I just buy Jeb. It's, it's cheap. So, of course um, Josh has that because he's, he's Josh. <laughs> of course he does. So then, so then the, the other thing is Dex to Jar will give you a command line thing. So if you want to do like greps and uh, finds through the code for specific things, um, I find that having a command line decompile with the source code and then I can grep through it. Um, and then I also have the GUI to be able to read through the code. Uh, it's just it's just nice. The GUI is good because it gives you all the, the nice markup and, uh, and um, reference stuff. But JADX GUI is not nearly as good as Jeb's GUI. Um, so... Basically, um, you know, at that point, then after you started looking through code again, you're sort of thinking about like, what things do I need to care about while you're looking for what are the web requests, what data is written to uh, out to files, what, um, you know, so, so basically if you start looking through the code and looking for um, variable names, even if you just have stuff that, you know, that you saw something like uh, I M E I in the uh, in the network, you can go down into the code and search for IMEI, and then figure out the code stands where they're doing stuff. Um, and you can usually just look for things like messages, phone, um, pictures, and those sorts of things. Just with a grep, recursive grep, you'll start finding things that you're interested in. And as you get a little better at this, and you start looking at the code, you also know that there are certain things that are of particular interest. Like there's there's a thing that I always grep for with get extras and get serializable extras, um, which I'm going to talk about why that's relevant in a second. But like that is a specific uh, method call that is interesting. It's, it's worth looking at always. So like as you start to build those things up, you, you, get, uh, you get better. Um, so interprocess communication becomes really interesting now um, where we have the potential where data is moving back and forth between apps. This is useful I mean, in, in a modern computing environment. You want to have this. Android has something called Intense, and that's just what they call their inter-process communication. Um, iOS has actually two different methods of transferring data. Before they implemented the document picker and all the different extension components, um, you had to use URL handlers. 
Um, so you used to have to go um, walk, look inside of the apps to see what um, handlers they declared, and then go look back in the iOS code to see how those handlers were um, parsed and what data they'd potentially accept, um, which was a complete uh, difficult thing to do. Um, Android's a little bit easier the, and intense get declared in the manifest so you can find them and then you can go find the code associated with that in the in the source code you can also use a tool called trozer now trozer is nice because instead of having to go into the code and try to figure out what it is trozer actually does this for you um, so you have to install trozer um, you set up a forward this is presuming that you've got a um a device and here I'm actually setting it up as though it's like a, a, a virtual device, um, forwarding port 31415 to the virtual device 31415. You can also do this. You can also do this with a, a, a networked one. You just call out the IP address, and then you connect with Drozer. Now Drozer has two parts. One is the um, one is the part that installs on your um, laptop, and then the other part is an is an APK that installs on the phone. And then it lets you run from your laptop commands on the APK. Now, the APK itself, as it's running, basically declares no privilege. And so what it's doing is it's looking around inside of the running Android environment, virtual or real phone, in order to see what sort of stuff it can see on other apps. So this one, I'm looking at this guitar tuner. That was the one that I had, um, you know, looked at earlier. So now I say run app package attack surface against this package, com overland guitar tuna. And with this, what I do is I see that there are seven activities exported. Now, just uh, if you're not familiar with Android apps, an activity is a user interface screen. A broadcast receiver is the app waiting to be told that some event happened. Hey, apps, um, you know, an SMS message was received, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, content providers are things like if if uh, Facebook gives address book information, that would be exported as a content provider. So then Facebook, the app, has data that it will give to other apps when those apps want that information. And then services are long-running components. And so a service is like... You ever notice on, on an Android phone, if you start watching a YouTube video, then you navigate away from the app, the video stops playing. But if you start a music app, like, you know, you, you start Amazon Music and then um, you navigate away from the app, the music keeps playing. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason for that is that an activity, like I said, is a user interface screen and activities only execute when the focus is on that particular activity. That activity stops executing as soon as the focus is taken away from it. But a service allows for extended running code. So if you're looking for something that's kind of nastier, um, services are more likely to contain right, the nastier right. stuff, right? Because it's like this code just keeps running all the time. So a lot of times these like spyware type um, applications, it's in the service is where you'll end up finding it. Um, so anyway, so you, you look at this and here I'm looking at this particular application. I'm running at, running app activity info inside of Drozer. This is the Drozer console that I'm typing on my laptop, but it's actually sending the task over to the phone. And then the phone is basically using the Android intent infrastructure to ask the other app, hey, what sort of stuff is there, right? And so now we have these different um, activities. So these are the activities that are exported. So it's interesting, um, this app, Calm Overland Guitar Tuna, look at, basically it's their one, um, <laughs> their one page and all the rest of it is Facebook integration. Right, so there's all this stuff inside of this app that their activities associated with Facebook integration. Now, that's probably because the developer was like, oh look, all this stuff is already built for me. Let me just grab this and pull it in and run with it. Right, so, so they basically have set it up as like a game component inside of Facebook in order to have this guitar tuner. But the challenge then becomes like, okay, well that's fine, but like while I'm tuning my guitar, um, what the hell are they doing related to Facebook information? <laughs> right? They're putting it on Facebook on how, how you're tuning your guitar, Doug. Exactly. What a terrible guitarist I am. That's what they're putting on Facebook. Right? How infrequently <laughs> I tune my guitar is basically what they're putting on there. So then this is this is where it gets interesting. So with an activity, with an activity, eventually what I'm looking for is um, an extra. Now an extra is a way for one app to send data to another app. And the way that the um, the the recipient app will parse the data is by running a method called get extras. And so inside of that get extras, it will then parse 
parameters that have been passed to that activity or service or whatever it is. So this is the way that data gets passed back and forth between apps. If there's no if there's no specific call um, that has the get extra, well then not a lot of then no data is being um, um, passed if there's no get extra, right? It's just here, open up this other page. But if there is data, then you need to be concerned what data is being passed between apps, right? So that's a that's a concern, something worth uh, investigating. Okay, so I'm going to leave some of the intense stuff behind and talk a little bit about file system um, from a, from a um, yeah, Chris, I, I don't know how much more you have to, but we're running short on time. So if you want to okay. wrap it up as um, quickly as possible. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So basically you can you can run an app for a little while um, and then get a backup of the app, pull some information out. One thing that I've found is a pain um, with Android now because Android phones are, um, are encrypted. Um, the backup will also be encrypted. So if you want to pull the raw data out, you need to use, I found abe.jar is the best one. So you run abe.jar, um, take your Android backup, end up with a decrypted backup, and then you are able to um, basically untar that content. Then you start looking through all the different data. And again, specific things related to the data. Are they looking to see um, you know, what sort of, uh, sort of information is being stored and has it been tampered with by something else? Most apps have no concern over the manipulation of data on the file system from the, uh, from the mobile device. Um, so just as you're starting to go through this, you're realizing like, oh man, there are all these different tools. So just a couple of references. I've got a tool list. Um, also this um, Tan Pratham on GitHub has a, um, a cheat sheet with loads of, uh, loads of tools. To set this sort of stuff up, a couple of uh, distros that you can grab, Mobisec, Androlab, Santuco. Um, and then just sort of on an ongoing basis, you wanna pretty much look at, look at this from the change to apps as they uh, as they go. So it's just, again, quick uh, quick overview of some things that you can do. There are a lot of skills that I'm um, hoping people start to develop and use the report cards and start digging into the code and take a look at stuff because it's not until someone says, hey, wait a minute, this damn thing is like sending my credit card information off over an unencrypted uh, connection. Mm -hmm. Or as an example, like, hey, this is really weird. This um, very large bank um, in the, the country of America um, sent a mobile application to the uh, to the Apple Store and oops, they forgot to turn TLS back on after they uh, huh. after they had done a QA session on it. That's actually a, a, a real one. Somebody eventually found that, but in the meantime, the people's username and credentials were just passing in plain text. Right. So in, until people start looking at this consistently, like it's just going to sit there latent, and a lot of people aren't going to notice it. And, People are going to have an opportunity to uh, to inspect it, or worse, the uh, the vendors are going to get away with uh, continuing to just basically juice people's data out of them. Well, so. Chris, you maybe want to evaluate every single app <clears throat> that I use on my Android phone <laughs> for well, security I mean, reasons, which is a good thing. But you've also given us a lot of great tips uh, and techniques in order to do so, and I encourage all of our listeners and viewers to do that because I think it's uh, one of those aspects in areas of security where there's not enough eyeballs looking at this problem um, because, of, like I mentioned in the beginning of this segment, <clears throat> some of the barriers to, to entry uh, into this field. So I thank you very much for your segment today. Yeah, of course. I, yeah. I, I, I was just going to say what very informative. Thing. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. I'm sorry. I, I found this very informative. Chris saw to think about, like, becoming a teacher or something yeah <laughs> well, yeah that's what so, i was gonna say I go was ahead, gonna say, a lot of people who come into sec 575 are actually looking for this sort of stuff right so in addition to the management 517 class i teach sec 575 a bunch and this is you know the the report card was something that josh built into that precisely to give the framework to people of like here like do this and here's how right so that's a i mean it's a it's a skill set that very few people have but it easily translates from a bunch of the other uh, skills that most people in the security industry have you just need a couple more tools and like nobody wants to get more tools or install more software on their laptops but I, I, you know <laughs> I, I thought that was great but i, I want to warn you chris the next time you request an uber it's going to be very likely that a black van is going to pull up and you'll never be seen again <laughs> yeah <laughs> uber knows where you are that's it chris no, thank you very much yeah. for appearing on security <laughs> weekly it's been a lot of fun very Thanks, informative folks. thank you very much all right Roger.
Right on. Appreciate it. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and talk about the security news for this week. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere.